Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for Episode 9 of Whelmed Season 3. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host, Emily. Hey, everybody. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, themes, Easter eggs, and comic book history, and everything else revolving around Young Justice, and we'll use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing all of them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. <laughs> whoa, 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 Donnie, gone! No worries, I can keep up with the tornado toddlers. <sighs> Thanks, Bart. I really appreciate the help. Today, especially. No, 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 down, down. Come on, Dad. Stay whelmed. Don't call him Dad. Oh, yeah, right. Spoilers. Sorry, Grandma. And don't call me Grandma. And with all of that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan. The title of this week's episode is Home Fires. The release date was January 18th of 2019. The in-episode date is that it takes place on September 28th through 30th. The writer was Greg Weissman. The director was Vinton Huke. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special voice uh, credits this week is everyone. Yep. We just, all, <laughs> all of them. Yes. No. Okay. Well, it's a long list. Here we go. And I didn't do this list. This. Thank you, Emily, for doing this enormous list this week. <laughs> We have David Sobolov as Lobo. We have Nicole Dubuque, of course, fan favorite writer, back as Iris West Allen. Uh, Lynn Stewart Pierce and Raquel Irvine, uh, played again by Denise Boot. Boot? I looked up the pronunciation. It seems to be Boot. It's French. Uh, Eduardo <laughs> Dorado Sr. Bruce Greenwood. I did not see that coming. Did he do Sr. before? I have last season. No We're gonna idea, have to look Rich. that up. Bruce Greenwood. I did not pick that one up. Uh, David K. Uh, Kaye, I think Kaye. Yeah, is Vandal Savage. Uh, Jason Marsden back as Bart Allen. Jeff Bennett as John Smith, aka Red Tornado. Masas Moyo as Cat Grant, Karen Beecher, and Anissa Pierce. Uh, Marina Sirtis back, of course, as Queen B. Roger Craig Smith as Ocean Master. Kath Suchi. As Queen Mera and Arthur, little baby Arthur. Where is my Arthur? We're going to get into that in a minute. Too. <laughs> the world Deborah, Deborah Strang as uh, Gretchen Good, G. Gordon Godfrey. We have James Arnold Taylor. Lucas Carr slash Ultra Humanite, Greg Weisman. He also and plays Lobo's Belt, but I decided not to list that He there. did, actually. Yes. Uh, speaking Interlac or whatever it did. I caught that one this time, too. I was like, that's, Interlac. <laughs> that sounded like Greg. Uh, and Gwendolyn Yao as uh, Lady Shiva. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode starts at a meeting of the light in Greater Bialia, where Queen Bee announces Correct. that... <laughs> I'm just going by the timestamps, Rich. <laughs> I know it says Greater Bialia, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm kidding. <laughs> so, somewhere in Greater Bialia, or Karak, or whatever you want to call it... Uh, <laughs> There is a meeting of the light where Queen Bee announces that the light has two situations to deal with, apparently. One being handled by the light's newest hire and the other by an acquaintance of Vandal Savage. Because when you're a supervillain, you got to be vague at the start of the episode. <laughs> we then cut over to Rimbor, where Lobo receives a bounty hunting contract from a contract bot and announces that he's off to go kill some earthlings. Like you do. Uh, and after the credits, we cut to Taos, New Mexico, where the Justice League and Star Labs announced the creation of the first MetaHuman Youth Center to help all of the Meta kids that we've seen hurt by Meta trafficking so far this season. That's a lot. A lot, a lot of, of announcements kids. at the beginning of this episode. <laughs> it's. In Central City, Iris West Allen watches this announcement on TV before welcoming Queen Mera and Prince Arthur. To her home for a super-powered play date. I just love saying it that way. With Don and Donnie, uh, the Speedster twins. But across the street from this happy scene, some creepy dude is watching through a telescope and comments that he's waiting for 12 more people to arrive. Over in Happy Harbor, Connor watches G. Gordon Godfrey interview Gretchen Good. 
about the ubiquitous Good Goggles and her partnership with Bruce Wayne to help victims of meta-human trafficking. And McGann heads off to work at Happy Harbor High with Lucas Carr before Connor takes Brian and Forager to training. Back in Central City, we see Will Harper chatting with Lynn Stewart Pierce, uh, Jefferson's ex-wife, at the superpowered play date, because I love using that phrase as much as possible. Uh, <laughs> they're talking about Nightwing's new team and their exes and the fact that everything everyone thinks that Will and Artemis are dating, apparently, which Roy insists they're not. <laughs> Will insists they're not. Overly. <laughs> I have we, I have feelings. We'll we'll talk about those feelings in a bit. I'm gonna interrupt we, every one of Emily's paragraphs. That's that's the move for today, apparently. <laughs> With commentary. We also see uh Rocket, her son Amistad, and a pregnant Karen Beecher arrive at superhero daycare before another ominous cutaway to the man watching from across the street. We then cut over to a quarry in where the outsiders are gathering for training, and Dr. Jace arrives to observe and awkwardly hug Halo and call her Gabrielle and make everyone uncomfortable. It's fine. Uh, she also apologizes to Brion for activating his metagene so many episodes later and asks what they're doing to get Princess Tara back. Brion tells her that Nightwing's working on it, only for Nightwing to immediately start shooting at all of them for training. It's for training. <laughs> and it's a test that Brion just fails almost immediately. Well, well he can't deal with sneak attacks. It tells attacks. us you need more preparation for surprise attacks. <laughs> <laughs> he's trying his best. He's just, Nightwing mood. <laughs> it's just a bit of a disaster. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the superpowered play date, because it is the best name, Red Tornado, or John in his John Smith android form, arrives with his adopted daughter. And the ominous observer across the street comments that he's only waiting on two more until it's time. And then opens a suitcase. I think that's when he opens a suitcase and it's we flash to... I don't think we see what it is yet. No, we don't see what it is, but it's it glows like... It's just an like, ominous uh, glowing suitcase, which is right. always a good thing. <laughs> Nothing ever bad ha right. happens with that. <laughs> Biggest surprise is that it wasn't green, kryptonite green. <laughs> At the quarry, Brown and Nightwing get into another fight about finding Princess Tara and Brown's lack of patience before they're interrupted by Lobo, apparently there to kill Forager. A fight breaks out between the heroes and the alien bounty hunter, during which time Lobo briefly kills Halo and refuses to reveal who hired him. Over in Central City, Lois Lane and Jonathan Kent, Superman's son, uh, arrive at the superpowered parent group. I had to keep thinking of synonyms but it's the best thing uh <laughs> and the man across the street is revealed to be none other than disgraced ocean master who spent the last six years in an atlantean prison and now plans to kill all of the super spouses and children ah uh, <laughs> this is not good uh however his plan is interrupted by lady shiva of all people uh who reveals that the light knows about the justice league's families but chooses not to use this nuclear option because it was, would result in mutually assured destruction. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> so much to unpack. When Lady Shiva is unable to dissuade Ocean Master from his assassination plan, she kills him under orders from the light. And... And then cleans the house. It's fine. And the superpowered playdate is none the wiser. None Back. Ah. Back at the quarry, the heroes seem to be holding their own until Lobo catches Forager and crushes him to death. That was awesome. <laughs> However, after Lobo flies away on his <laughs> space bike. It's a space, space bike. bike. He used to have space dolphins that hung out with him, too. Did you know that? <laughs> that was how he knew he wasn't totally a villain. Forager <laughs> reveals that he tricked Lobo by shedding his exoshell and allowing him to smash it. <laughs> Yay for happy hive of superhero friends. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to read all my stupid notes, Rich. I'm reading it. I don't have time to read it. Okay. This is why the stupid notes go in there, to catch you off guard. I know. There was a hashtag somewhere in here that caught me off guard. I wish I hadn't read it first. It's good. It's later on. We'll get to it. <laughs> we'll get to it. We then cut over to Greater Bialya, where Lady Shiva arrives at the Lights meeting. 
Queen Bee announces that Shiva is now the Light's new enforcer, and Vandal says that Lobo's mission has confirmed Count Vertigo's account that Superboy and Black Lightning helped break up the metatrafficking ring in Markovia. The Light is now aware of Nightwing's new team, and Granny Goodness steps out of the shadows to reveal that a plan is already in place to take care of these naughty children. Eh. I believe is the phrase she uses. Uh, no. Classic. There's a yeah. reason I didn't write that. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like I don't it want either. It here. I don't like it. But it's classic granny. She's a whole lot. She's a lot and very old. All right, let's feel some aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. So superpowered playdate. I am overjoyed play about superpower playdate. Like a plot. When- the first time that we watched this episode, like the second it was revealed, it's like everyone's coming to the Allen house to have a superpowered play date. I'm like, oh, I didn't know I needed this, but it's the best choice. Oh yeah, for sure. And for just sure. getting to see all of these kids and revealing like both kids we knew about, like we see Leon and we see uh the twins and all of that, and all of these kids that we didn't know existed. Yeah. It's just great. I love how they do this. I Jonathan Kent shows up and just makes me want to see Superboy interacting with his little baby nephew. I want yeah. it so bad. <laughs> Super Sun set up. It's going to be great. With just it would be so good. Uh cuz we kn- we know Connor's good with kids cuz of season 1 and I just want to see it again and it would be really cute. I just want I just want cute happy things from this show. Uh no pain, no sadness. It's fine. But like <laughs> So does that make Jonathan Connor's nephew? That's what I've been going with, yes. Since season two confirmed that uh, Connor and and, uh, Clark decided to just be like, we're brothers. He's not my son. We're brothers. It's easier this way. I think they are. They seem to be identifying as brothers. So it would be. I think he he calls him little brother in season two at one point, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think that. And that always worked for me. So it'll be, he'll be Uncle Connor. He's Uncle, he's he's Uncle Connor. Uncle. Uncle Connor. <laughs> okay. I'm going to, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm going I'm to let this Emily cry fine. a minute and I'll take on the next section. This is, it's fine. <laughs> okay. I'll talk about Tornado for a minute. We can come Go back talk to about Tornado. Tornado. I'm well, fine. I'm, it's fine. So <laughs> <laughs> Tornado shows up in his android form with uh, a girl behind him who <laughs> we know is Treya Sutton. From the comics, anyway. And Treya Sutton, we assume. Treya Sutton, uh, she looks about the right age. I think Treya Sutton was 11 or 12. Treya was saved from a war in Bialya in the actual DC Comics line and was adopted by Kathy Sutton, who became John Smith's wife. This brings up a lot of questions for me, just seeing her there and these yep. connect. So, I mean, somehow Karak became part of Bialya? So there had to have been a war conflict? I guess. I guess. Right? Because she tried to do it the peaceful way by mind controlling people, but that didn't work. So Did maybe that, that war did work? happen. It didn't work with the original president. I can't imagine it would work again. there was the tie-in comics where, they, where she went and mind controlled more people. It was the brother, right? Yeah. But I don't, I don't but know. the brother, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It I'm thinking, somehow. well, I, and, and I guess that's my point, really, because, I mean, you could be 100% right. Like, we don't know. But like in the comics, we know that the Bialyan Karaki yeah. conflict, you know, Treya was was orphaned there, and then. But it also brings up some other questions too, like not just what happened in the two years between, but also, I have questions about Red Tornado's powers. <laughs> <laughs> so, did he create an android body that has the same technology that allowed him to control wind? If that's what happened with his original robot body and if so why would he ever change bodies why would he not just stay with the updated technology or maybe he does now we don't know i guess we haven't seen that because secret identities yeah but i mean why would you like okay i'm gonna go into my worst superhero form to fight crime he could always update his superhero form but it always looks that i mean this the pit we have a picture of him joining the justice society in the 1940s and his robot body looks exactly the same 
for aesthetic purposes. I guess. Maybe I don't maybe know. all of the other like the internal hardware gets better. But he's oh, just maybe. like, no, that's this possible. Is, this is my look. But but here's the other twist too. <laughs> There's definitely a take on Red Tornado in the comics where his powers are actually not mechanical. Like he's a sapient android being that was actually possessed by this elemental. So this wind elemental. So does his powers move with his consciousness transferring between bodies? Because that's interesting. It's not implied because <laughs> you also have Firebrand and Red Torpedo and they seem to have power. I don't know. I have questions. But one way or the other, he's got powers in this android form. And I don't know why he just doesn't put a costume on and use the higher tech. I'm not sure. I don't know. Rich, I don't I could, know either. I can't explain to you why Red Tornado does anything. But I know what you can explain to me, which is the observation that you made that I read about in the outline just before the thing that I wrote down about Tornado that I did not notice <laughs> about. Oh, yes, <laughs> Karen. <laughs> I was about to say I have questions about Karen. Um, you have questions about Red Tornado. I didn't. I, have I didn't have questions Karen. about Karen, but I do now because you're my co-host. Because Karen shows up. Karen Bumblebee. We all know her. We all love her. Everybody's favorite cheerleader, scientist extraordinaire. She shows up. She's pregnant. We have no in indication of who she's with, right. who the father of her child is. Could be. And Mel. I realized watching the episode again for the millionth time, she's not wearing a wedding ring, which, you know, I'm not going to make any assumptions about whether or not she's married because it is a cartoon. Sometimes this might slip through and somebody might go, she's only, you only see her hand for two shots and nobody said add a wedding ring. It happens. But like, I want to know who Karen's still with. Is she still with Mal? Is she with someone else? I have questions. And, and I want to know. It does happen, but not usually in Young Justice. <laughs> <laughs> true. Um, true, yes. true. And also, so I'm running through the playlist now. So aside from John, Karen's the only other active superhero parent that shows up. We don't even know if Karen is still active, though. We haven't seen Karen as Bumblebee this season. That's true. But I'd ha for some reason, I have a heart. I mean, maybe not while she's pregnant. Yeah. I don't know what happens. Ro when Rocket is also still a hero. Oh, Rocket. Red as Tornado well. right. and Rocket that's are right. both there. I forgot. That's right. Rocket was. meets her at the door with Amistad. And everyone else is a is a partner of a superhero or a retired superhero in Will's case. Oh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, there's Will, too. Okay, so it is a bit of a mix and match, which I'm glad. Oh, because in the some weird stuff in the comics happens to Mal. <laughs> of course, they reboot a bunch of stuff in DC regularly, but they did get married at one point. But then Mal, he did become Guardian, but then he got really badly injured, if not part, like, almost killed <laughs> and then he, he was he, it, but that was when he had found some uh, a angelic horn and became <laughs> like the. I think he called himself Gabriel or something, and he had this horn. I'm a little confused on that. And then, then he almost died. And then tornado and someone else with nanotech powers, cyborg, <laughs> I think, rebuilt him. And so he has like mechanical voice box that has power. I mean, it gets bonkers. I think I talked about it in the uh, Bumblebee Secret Origins episode. Um, Comics it gets, are wild. It rich. gets wacky. So I'm like not even convinced. I'm like, what did you guys do to Mal? It's terrible. We'll, we'll, we'll find see. out. This is this is the new version of like when season two started and we all just screamed, wait, where are Wally and Artemis at our TVs for six episodes? Uh, but there's so many more characters, so now it's just every every couple of episodes. We're just like, wait, where is everyone? <laughs> where is everyone in this where universe? Where is Arthur? <laughs> we don't know. He's not Aquaman anymore. Is he ruling he Atlantis? Is he? Is he? I don't know. I mean, I mean, I guess that's the simplest answer, I suppose, but... He wanted to he retire. Was, he was doing it. Pass the mantle on to someone younger. Sure, I guess. His kid's growing up. He doesn't want to miss that. I, I don't know. Uh, good dad, Aquaman. Like yeah. Mara's queen. <laughs> I mean, I I'm sorry. I was laughing because, like last weekend, my daughter, who's five, was playing with her cousin, who's about the same age. 
I don't know what happened, but they came running by and they're like, we're going to, uh, her cousin said, I'm going to go play. And my daughter was like, I'm coming with you. And she said, no, I'm the princess. I play. You're the queen. You have work to do. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter put her hands on her hips and she was like wait a minute <laughs> and i was like i was like you need to delegate you should the queen can delegate and she turned to me and she said you're the jester dad papa you do all my work and ran off and i was like <laughs> she said she said i designate you to do all the work so there you go so by definition of that interaction, Queen Mira's got stuff to do. She's got work to do. <laughs> that's that's what proves that Queen Mira's got right. stuff to do. Not the way actual monarchy works. No, no I guess not really. Just, anyway. just this interaction. <laughs> I love it. I approve. It was but a historical yeah, reenactment with lots of accuracy, Emily. Yes, clearly. Uh, but we still don't know where Aquaman, not Aquaman, where, where oh, Arthur is. We know where is. Aquaman is. We know where Aquaman is busy. <laughs> Aquaman has Am I not allowed to, to even call him Arthur anymore? Has he got to be King Orm? Okay. I don't know. I don't even know anymore. <laughs> but aside from the superpowered play date that we love so much, I love it. I would, I would watch Younger Justice every week. I would. I would. It's like Muppet gonna, Babies, but with just with these kids. Younger I'm gonna justice. I'm gonna talk about this in Canary Debrief a little bit. It'll be good. I got. I'm. I, somebody tell me. Somebody tell me where King Orin is. That's all I have to say. <laughs> we Greg, cannot rest until we know. Greg, please. We know what happens to Prince Orm. Okay. Anyway. So. Aside from the superpowered play date, I do have other notes, I promise. I I really like the idea of the metahuman youth center that is presented in this with where like giving these kids a chance to like reform and have mentors and figure all of that out and getting to see like the villain kids getting a chance to not just go to prison because they're 15 and they were under mind control. Uh, as well as as well as like bringing back some of the runaways we haven't seen where all of them are but we do see ed in this and we see his dad Mm -hmm. and they're brought there by black canary and captain marvel which i think is such an interesting choice for who they picked because we know black canary is like a therapist basically so of course that makes perfect sense and the idea that captain marvel is like i'm a kid i i can i can figure out how kids work and I love it. I I love this whole idea. I would also watch a whole show that is about the Meta Human Youth Center and like these kids just getting into after school shenanigans. I love this idea too that it's a great thing. It, I mean, it's a great way to be like, look, we're we're basically like in <laughs> putting in all of these potential superhero kids into this DC universe now. How is that going to affect the entire world, <laughs> right? And so instead of saying like, well, just give them all a costume and have them join the team, you know, you've got something that actually makes some sense. Like you're, you've got yeah. people who are trained to do this and you've got these other kids that we've already seen that have gone through this process um, and having this thing where, cause some of these kids powers, you know, they may not be something that's life shattering. You know what I mean? They may just have triggered some kind of self-defense mechanism. The metagene, you know, kicked in and, and they have some simple basic power. They just need to learn how to live with again, you know? And so, yeah, I love it as well. I think it's great. And it's a great setup for all kinds. I mean, again, Young Justice imprint. You could have a whole whole comic series with the MetaHuman Youth Center, yes. right? It's kind of like DC's equivalent of a more official run, you know, home for mutant kids, you know? <laughs> but it's like after school. So it's like all after school shenanigans. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, because it's a youth center, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I would love it. I love that idea. I hope I hope we revisit it before the end of the season. I also, again, shifting gears because there's a lot of a lot of cutting between different scenes in this episode. Despite there being like an A plot and a B plot, we also just cut around to a bunch of stuff. Right. And I realized that to me, it's hilarious. It took me until now to realize this. But McGann and Connor just have a psychic conversation in this episode. And I'm like, from Brion and Forager's perspective, these two probably spend just a decent amount of time just staring at each other, making <laughs> hand gestures. 
And they're like, what? What? Because like, it's a conversation they could easily have out loud. They just don't. <laughs> right. Living with telepaths problems. <laughs> Hashtag. Living with telepath problems. That's right. Uh, but it's, I like it. It's, it's funny. I like it. We also get to see, like, this is the first episode, I'm pretty sure, where we see what McGann's job is. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Like, because we've seen so much of the season, a lot of this blends together, and then rewatching it, it was like, oh, right, this is the first time we find out McGann works at Happy Harbor, and that Snapper Carr is the principal of Happy Harbor, and they're all just there. So many fun facts from this episode. <laughs> Shifting back to the superhero playdate for one second, because I can't believe I forgot to mention this when we were talking about it for a while. Uh, this is this is the episode where we get that conversation that Rich has feelings about, <laughs> where yeah. where Lynn is like, "What's up with you and Artemis?" and Will has a minor freakout and is like, N- "No, no, nothing. No, no." Um, and it's. <sighs> It's a scene. Rich, please share your feelings about the scene. Well, <laughs> and I'll have mine. I actually don't know if it's intentional or not. It doesn't seem like it should be based on some other things we end up seeing. But like, Wu protests a lot in, in, a, in an awkward way that's, that's definitely a me thinks he does protest too much situation that made me really uncomfortable for some reason. But I think that, I mean, I can totally see Will going like, whoa, 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 everybody back off. Like, no, that's not a, that's not a thing. But he, he makes, he goes, he goes, ha, 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 ha. He just does this like weird laugh. <laughs> he, he, who, I'm just like, wait a minute, Will, 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 Will. No, buddy. So I I chalk it up to a couple of things. I chalk it up to one, Will is caught off guard because I don't think Will's like brain is in that space at all. And the fact that someone would even suggest like he hadn't even thought of that, like to me it reads a little bit like he's like, wait, what? I didn't know. What? What? Yes. I think it could uh, be read that way. Yes. Uh, a little bit of that combined with also my brain thinks about this from an actor perspective of if Crispin Freeman did not have all of the scripts for later episodes where we see certain things and know that Artemis and Will aren't together, uh, I could see an actor trying to be like, how do I read this line to be read both ways? Because if you don't know how that line is going to be taken in the future, you as an actor have to be like, am I saying this like I really am saying no? Am I saying this like... Well, I'm assuming they, I assume they, they did the thing that, like, where they do a whole bunch of takes, right? We had Vanessa Marshall yes. on discussion yes, sessions, yes. Zeno and, and, and Zara, and they're all just recently talking about how they, you know, well, I did a, a whole bunch of takes in different ways, and then I don't know yeah. what they're going to use, right? Yeah. Which kind of makes sense, but that's the one they chose. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> It's I feel weird. bad for Will. I feel bad that Will is just like, I'm just going to take my daughter to a play date. And someone's just like, are you dating your sister-in-law? And he's just like, no, what? <laughs> what? No, I wasn't prepared for this question. <laughs> this, I didn't think I was going to wake up today and have to address that assumption. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> poor Will. <laughs> Leave him be. <laughs> yes, he's doing his best. He's being good dad. He's great. I love him. Hashtag on point dad. Hashtag Dad Harper. Um, <laughs> Dead point. <laughs> too many hashtags. <laughs> but the rest of this episode is Lobo trying to kill Forager, uh, basically. <laughs> yeah. And I, with these scenes of all of them showing up to train together, I really love that Forager's trying to understand people. It's really heckin' cute. Uh, <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> it's just cute. I just need to say that Forager's cute. Uh, we also we also get the moment in this episode that is hilariously awkward. There's a lot of awkward in this episode. There's, there's a lot of awkward in this episode. But we have the thing where it's, uh, Artemis is when Dr. Jace is like, thank you guys for letting me tag along and see all of this. And Artemis is like, nah, thank, thank Jefferson. He convinced us you should be here. And Jefferson's like, oh, she did. I'm like, uh... <laughs> But the funniest thing to me about this scene is that there is a moment of silence after this happens where they just kind of look at each other like awkward teenagers. And in the background, 
there's just an eagle screech. <laughs> and I want to thank whatever sound editor decided that was the right thing to put here because it works perfectly and I love it. It's just such a good little like period on that scene hashtag eagle of awkwardness um rich is just dying i was reading through our notes and there's just the note just says hashtag eagle of awkwardness rich can't i can't all these hashtags kill me why not friendship why not friendship why not just friendship i am emotions was another one i both of those were not hashtags. Both of those were just things I said in the moment. <laughs> they are now. Uh, but uh. again, with that scene, as Rich tries to remember how to breathe, I also love how to just cement that awkwardness of that scene. They cut over to Connor, Artemis, and Halo, looking at them like, uh, what did you just say but forager isn't even phased and i love it because forager has no reason to think that this is an awkward thing to say he's just like hello i am forager i am forager 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 is forager (laughs) forager is forager it's so cute uh but yeah that scene's hilarious hashtag eagle of awkwardness (laughs) but other things do happen in this training montage and so I have a question to pose to you, Rich, to yeah. hear your opinions on this. And that is simply, uh, where did Nightwing learn to fire a gun? <laughs> yeah, that one, I saw that as well. <laughs> there's nothing, <laughs> I'm like, there's something, okay, <laughs> there's just this shot of Dick like standing on top of those rocks with this rifle over his shoulder. And I'm like, hmm, this should bother me, but for some reason it's not really. <laughs> And so I had to put a bunch of thought into it, and then I saw you put it in the notes, which was perfect. Because so here's my here's my headcanon, right? Go for it. Uh, the Bat Family shot at constantly. <laughs> Fair <laughs> point. Right? They're shot at a lot. I've seen issues in the comics uh, where Dick or Bruce or Jason or someone like literally grabs a hand, like puts their hand over the top of somebody's handgun, like an uh, uh, an automatic. And like hit clicks the release and takes the slide off the gun, like disassembles the gun, like in their hand. I don't know. They have to know and understand how guns work. I get that. Bruce has this deep psychological issue against using guns and against killing people, right? And Dick has a deep seated need not to kill anybody, but that's not the same thing. Like Dick doesn't have an he doesn't, he doesn't want to kill people, so he's not going to use guns. And that's what he was trained to do was not use guns. But he doesn't have an issue with, like, picking them up. Like, if you look at the beginning of the Batman Beyond TV series where, you know, Bruce is in his 50s and he's got the yeah. powered suit on and he picks the gun up because he's having a heart attack and tries to defend himself, he's horrified by the whole idea. That tracks with me. Dick, I'm kind of okay with him knowing how to use this, this weapon. But it just also, I mean, you can't practice dodging gunfire without ever having faced something akin to gunfire like yep. you know there's got to be some way that they've learned how to do this and i also think you know you need to know the enemy quote unquote so i'm kind of okay with this and, and it was a little bit of surprise to me because i'm not okay with bruce picking up firearms and starting to shoot yeah. people i don't care if they have rubber bullets or not even in dark knight returns the frank miller it was really dark and stuff and i was just like mm, kind of having okay but that was like it was supposed to be a self-contained you know potential view, vision of a potential future and i'm like okay but like when i see it in other things you know movies and stuff like that i just i'm just like i got i have issues with that with this i don't know the rubber bullets and things makes perfect sense. Also, the team has to defend themselves against firearms, right? So I don't know. For some reason, this didn't bother me as much as I expected it to. Yeah, It didn't really bother me. I was just like, my first thought was like, wait, where did you learn this? Because Bruce obviously would not teach him how to fire a gun. I remember, I think I saw somewhere online, somebody posed the idea of maybe Alfred taught him how to shoot and I could believe that or just training somewhere else with someone if this uh, alfred is the alfred that used to be in mi6 <laughs> right? right if this is the uh the the 007 alfred that we've gotten in some other you know some interpretations of the comics also it happened in batman the animated series there was an episode 
where one of his old agents that he, Alfred used to work with like showed up and they had a whole adventure together. And then um, what was it? It was not the Batman. It, it was the Batman CGI series. Like that Alfred was like his bodyguard. <laughs> that guy was that guy was amazing. So, um, I mean, yeah, that's a possibility as well. I mean, but I did expect it to bother me because I have like this core thing that bugs yeah, me yeah, about yeah. Batman and guns. And when I saw Dick, I was kind of like, why is this not? Why am I not getting on a soapbox necessarily? And I had to like sit and process my feelings on that. But uh, other things from this from this whole scene i like i like the irony of connor being the one to tell people <laughs> to dial it down because it's it's my favorite ongoing thing this season of just mm. connor being chill and grounded while everyone else growth. is a disaster i love it character growth right there but something that i don't like as much is i i don't like seeing halo being brutalized i had to rewatch this episode nope. twice for outline purposes and the whole time i was just like no no i don't like it i feel like the same action and the same impact could have been accomplished with the wide shot of seeing it go towards her and like the close-up of her face and like those two shots together are enough for me to know oh god that's a lot and that's horrible i don't need to see the gratuitous yep. gore of halo being impaled i don't need that in my life i am not a fan of that scene at all i think it was i will go so far as to say it was unnecessary uh it may have been uh, the most unnecessary shot in the entire series and technically that's not saying very much because 95 percent of the scenes over three seasons hold multiple layers of meaning over multiple seasons <laughs> so to say that it's an unnecessary shot i mean yeah. It doesn't take much to become an unnecessary shot, but not only is it an unnecessary shot, it's a shot that I did not want or need. So I'm, I'm this, that, that I'll, I'll be pretty straightforward about this. Did not need that. And I will even go so far as I think that it could have been, it, it could have been much better writing in the scene instead of saying like, Oh, Lobo kills people. Of course we'll have him kill Halo is to say, or you could actually have him injure everyone but he doesn't really injure anybody. And I'm like, why don't you have Brion take a hit to the leg? And why don't you have Dick actually get hit and have blood on him? Why don't you have like, if you're going to, if you need to show that Lobo is a brutal killer and a fighter that ranks up with going toe to toe to super with Superman, then why don't you have Connor break his arm? Like, or you know what I mean? Like do something where you are spreading this out a bit, because now we've gotten multiple times of, halo being hurt and i'm like and it's this is i mean to me, also you throwing out the idea of connor breaking a bone says a lot more to me than halo getting killed yes because halo getting killed we have already established halo is not invulnerable halo is regenerative so like that just tell halo can be killed as much as any other normal human can be killed but if you injure connor like we've established on the show injuring connor is like a thing. If that happens, you know this is bad. Yeah. Because Connor doesn't get injured. Uh so Absolutely. yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Uh <laughs> it's it's a lot. I don't, I don't need it. Yeah. That's just me. All right. So we we've gotten on our soapbox about that one. So let's let's move on to the next thing yes. because the next thing is a chain reaction of what? That affects the entire rest of everything in Young Justice to me. Yeah, so let's let's take a minute and try and try to unpack. I'm not sure we even can, but let's try to unpack the fact that the light knows about the superhero families and the kids and they just don't do anything about it. I I have seen yep. this episode so many times and I'm still not sure I fully process everything surrounding that. It's so much. It's like, because it's a fantastic idea of pointing out the fact that no supervillain would actually act on it, knowing that it would just, it would burn the world to the ground <laughs> on some level. If you know Lois and you know Jonathan, that means you know Clark, which means you know Superman's secret identity. And yes, absolutely. Like this nuclear option of the kids and the spouses and the partners, and uh, that's a terrible option. But Lex knows who Superman is. Yeah. So what? <laughs> like that's a that's a thing. That's a whole thing right there. 
Yeah, I mean, the only, yeah, I don't even, do I? Like, we can't even, we genuinely can't even talk about this. Every time we try to talk about this, we're like, there's too, there's too much to unpack. We're like, wait, so this means that they know this, and this, and this, and this, oh God. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, so even just looking at this scene, looking at this scene, I went back to think about this. You can help me with this. So pretty much the only main leaguers that we can't be sure that the light knows their secret identities are Bruce, Diana, Canary, and Ollie, maybe the Hawks. Oh, I guess yep. Hal. Oh, no. Well, maybe. Well, but the the Glanterns are always weird anyway because they're kind of public identities almost. Like, yeah. Cle- and I mean, Wonder if Woman's they know, also kind of weird because she's also kind of her public identity. Kind of, yeah. Like maybe Depending it doesn't matter so much. Like she's just is who she is, and people know that, right? I'm not even sure you can include uh, Canary and Green Arrow on there because Roy's there, and if they know who Roy is, will if they know who Red Arrow is. Yep. Yep. You are you are absolutely you can- correct. You can reverse engineer your way to some mentor secret identities. Yeah. Because so pretty if you much, figure out who Green Arrow Bruce. is, you figure out who Black Canary is by default in my yeah. mind. And this this actually feeds into another thing because I, I got into this whole thought exercise because there's another ob- observation you made, which is really good, which was like Artemis wears part of her costume and doesn't wear her mask during these training exercises yes. sometimes. Yeah, in, but this, di- in this episode. But Dick does. If he's got yep. his Nightwing outfit on, he's got his mask on. And yep. so I was, I made a comment in here about like, I think he puts it on out of reflex, but he still doesn't believe that anyone knows his real identity, right? So Artemis knows that she's known by the light, right? I can't yep. see Dick putting on his Nightwing costume without the mask ever. So having, but having said that, he has no costume or mask in a lot of these training scenes over a couple of these episodes where he's clearly there with people that they know. And he's obviously Dick Grayson. <laughs> he's obviously rich boy son of Bruce Wayne training. So, I mean, so they've got, I mean, if they knew at the end of this episode, if they knew, oh, now we know that, you know, they say something like Lobo doesn't know that he failed. And I'm like, how did you know he failed? <laughs> Were you satellite watching that beach? And what happened after? Like, wh- how do you even know Lobo failed? And if you did, that means maybe you do know Dick is Nightwing. And if you do, that means they do know that Bruce and therefore Barbara, who is wearing the goggles and all of that stuff. <sighs> it's so stressful. I had a thought, but okay. I will reserve it for crashing the mode. All right, we should do that. For how the light might know things. Oh, my. But. Okay, let's save it for Crash the Moon. (laughs) Okay. Ocean Master. Ocean Master. Been in jail. For six years. Six years. And I. We think attempted regicide. Yeah, that thing from the tie-in comics. Yeah, so if if you're curious about that, there's a two-parter. My favorite part of the series. <laughs> Actually, you could go back and listen to our tie-in because it was it was all super Martian like nonsense. It's super Martian flirting underwater, so it's both it's of our favorite. Things. All of our nonsense wrapped up into one two-parter. Yes. Yay, nonsense. Um, go read that one. But that's also where things happened with Prince Orm. This is where in technically in Young Justice we find out that Ocean Master and Prince Orm are actually the same person, which we don't get confirmation of in the actual series. Yep. The sh- I realized watching this episode and talking about it and I'm like the show never addressed Ocean Master. He just disappears. Poor disgraced Ocean Master. That's the only line we get, I think. Yeah. <laughs> when Black Manta Black steps Man. up. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but- tie in comics. If you haven't read them by now, I don't even know read what's them. happening. Go read them. It's just more more amazing Young Justice. But speaking of Ocean Master, that juxtaposition at the end of this episode between the happy superhero playdate house and just the murder scene just works really well and is so creepy and so just chilling, but it's done so well. It's just those quick cutaways between like, Murder scene, happy house, cleaned up murder scene, happy house, 
it's it's fine. It's so Nothing creepy. bad could ever happen. And you're just like, I can't process. Along that same line, I think that the scene of Ocean Master getting beheaded, which sure is a lot, uh, is han- is handled really well. In yeah. that I, weirdly enough, don't find that violence gratuitous in the same yeah. way that Halo's scene feels. Because it's shot in such a way that you're like, shot, drawn, staged, <laughs> all of the above. In such a way where you're like, I know exactly what happened, but it's not like, let's zoom in on... <laughs> Ocean Master's dead and mutilated body. That's yeah. not what happens. And I appreciate that that's not what happens because with fewer restrictions, they could have and chose not to there. Yeah. I'm just going to throw out, throw out this observation. I don't think Go for it's it. not, it doesn't make me not like the Halo scene less. But Lobo is brutal. Lady Shiva is precise. Yes. And so there is a bit of character representation in that to me although i still say that scene with lobo with him being brutal could have been could have been spread out more uh yes. and and had i think a bigger impact for me to me as a watcher i don't know if everyone feels this way but you know if i see nightwing get get caught and you know hurt and i see superboy get an arm broken and you know black lightning and like or even jace who's like a totally normal person who's running around in this scene somewhere having something serious happen to her. You know what I mean? It's just like Globo's just carnage. I'm trying to get a job done. You guys are all in my way. Get out of my way. Right? Yeah. And so, yeah, I don't know. But still, there is a thing there that I feel like, and it, it, and it even represents itself in that the thing that I think is one of the creepiest things in the whole episode is is the this thing you were just talking about where suddenly the house is cleaned up. Yep. And no one would know. And I just, it gave me, it gave me the willies. <laughs> watching it's, it's so creepy. when i realized what what happened there right yep it's so creepy and yeah. we all know horror movies have taught us well that putting children laughing over anything will always make it creepier uh, so creepy yeah yes anything any anyway i have one thing i think and then a couple things from neil but do you have anything to wrap up i got my last two things are i do Want to give a shout out to Artemis's Welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. That's right. Which has been our mid-roll lead-in for the past several episodes. But I also just love it. It's a good line. It's real fun. Artemis is great. And last point, to go back to the light real quick for me, last point, uh, is that I think it's really interesting watching this and seeing that the light still refers to Connor as the Superboy. Oh yeah, uh, like he's still he's still an the object Cadmus project. Yeah, and that's so it's such it's such a small thing, but it's so interesting that like everybody calls him Superboy except the light. Light is like he's the Superboy. He's that thing, and that's so creepy. The same way that they don't call Artemis Artemis, and they don't call Artemis Tigress, they call Artemis Sportsmaster's younger daughter, and how yeah. they just see her as like connected to him. Right, and that's 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 a thing, and it's an interesting just way of showing how our villains think about things yeah it shows that internal internal viewpoint through dialogue yeah. which i think is really good yeah um, i like it neil mentioned here this is the first full reveal of season three's silhouettes of the light of the light um which brings up a thing that i'm excited about i don't know why i'm so excited about this but i am ultra humanite is a member and i'm not really sure why they weren't <laughs> to start with like Ultra Humanite in the Revelations episode, I was like, Ultra, why, why are you quote unquote using Ultra Humanite? You should be <laughs> recruiting Ultra Humanite. Like, mm, Joker, okay, yeah, <laughs> I get that. Vertigo, okay. Black Adam, eh, he's always not been really controllable. Ultra Humanite, <laughs> come on, right? Genius level intellect in a Gorilla City powerful build gorilla body. I don't know why you would want anything else. Um, speaking of, I, I, I'm referring to Ultra Humanite as they because I'm not really sure of the pronouns here <laughs> because according to the tie-in comics, again, go read the tie-in comics, uh, the body they're in now is technically a male gorilla, but it was transferred from a previously female human body that they lived in for decades and before that was in a male human body that appears to have identified as male. So I'm not I'm not really sure. So I'm probably gonna work on calling Ultra Humanite Day from now on <laughs> in my life. I think Young Justice is redefined Ultra Humanite for me. Why are comics 
so complicated. <laughs> I do a whole, I had to do those 16 mini secret origins on gorillas. Yep. <laughs> Go listen to that comic commentary tie-in. I talk about this is the episode where whole... we're just like listen to the tie-in comics. <sighs> Man, it's crazy. Neil says he laughs every time Lobo refers to Forger as an Earthling because he says some Earthlings are gonna die at the beginning, and I'm like, wait, yep. but you don't. Well, maybe he doesn't know. Maybe he doesn't know what a new god is. I don't know. It's just just who he is. He doesn't care. Right. He's going to Earth. It's from Earth. It's the same thing Connor and McGann have to deal with. Yeah. They're not yeah. human. Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the comics, the comic that Archer's reading is the Blue Falcon and Dino Mutt that we mentioned, I think, in the <laughs> Scream Something Scream episode. Something. Yeah. Definitely want them in Young Justice. I want to see what that is. Um, Owings Mills is the quarry, er- and it's a real yep. city, yep. Neil said, in Maryland that has a quarry near it called Delight Quarry that has been shut down for some time. So that might be the quarry that they're using, you just said. Um, oh, yeah. I just me. imagine like Nightwing trying to rent out that quarry. Like, I need it for reasons. <laughs> right. For or stuff. buying the quarry, maybe. <laughs> True. Yeah. R- rich boy, rich boy things. First world problems. Just do that. Um, I noticed this too, actually. I forgot to mention it. Neil brought it up. He said, goes to show how much of a beast Lobo is when comparing Connor fighting Bedlam and taking him down in three shots to Connor yeah. fighting Lobo. And it also uh, interesting to think that uh, Nightwing assumed it was either Mantis or Macom that would order the kill on Forager. Yeah. Right? Because both, both of them don't like Forager. And they're the only people that Nightwing knows don't and, like Forager Night- right now. Nightwing never met Macom. Actually, he never true. met Mantis either, so he must have gotten reports on all that, right? Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You'd assume. You know, if you if you bring an alien back from another planet, you kind of got to explain to Nightwing what wh- how you got this. <laughs> right. Uh, Neil was trying to find the 16 in this episode. He said the for sale sign on the house across the street next to the one Ocean Master is in <laughs> when Lois and Jonathan go in the house says 555 555- 0116. He said he thinks that's the only 16 he could find in the episode, which I think is. <laughs> he also wanted to know if Guji was actually written in the script or if Zared had lived it, which I think is great. And then, of course, uh, Lobo's uh, pinky finger, uh, which may show up in a, a little later. We'll crash the mode. <laughs> Not really. Crash the credits? I'm not sure. Anyway, <laughs> with all that, we've, we've done a lot this episode. Uh, let's get out. We'll do a quick mid-roll and then come back for some Canary Debrief and more. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. A couple things we want to share this week. Emily hosted her panel again at this year's Clark Con. It was entitled Teen Superhero Teams, The Good, The Bad, and the hormones. She recorded it, Richard Kreutz Landry edited it, and Neil put the final touches on. And now, if you're a Patreon backer, you can go listen to it. Emily discussed a number of other teen-focused comics and shows like X-Men Evolution, Runaways, the original comic runs of both Young Justice and Teen Titans, and more. And you'll find her outline and a PDF of her presentation as well as the recording on our Patreon page. This week, I wanted to share an email we received about some earlier episodes. This message is from Star Sapphire. Hi team, I'm a regular listener and just now discovered your four-part episode of Masks, A New Generation, the actual play we called Relations. Coincidentally, I just started getting into tabletop RPGs. Anyways, I love these episodes. Please do something like this again. I really enjoyed listening to the story play out and hearing everyone's take on their assigned character. To me, it showed just how big of fans you guys are of the show. You know your characters inside and out, and because of that, I appreciated this segment so much. Thank you for giving fans this gameplay run-through, even if it was almost two years ago. (laughs) Thank you, Star Sapphire. For those of you who may also not be familiar with these episodes, Brendan Conway, the creator of the RPG Masks, A New Generation, came onto the show to run discussion guests Darcy Ross, Anishan Sherwood, as well as Emily, myself, and producer Neil through an original Young Justice story set on the day Connor and McGann graduated from Happy Harbor High School. 
that group has accumulated 80 plus years of role playing experience. And we all agree that session was one of the best we've ever played. Add in Neil's amazing editing and sound effects magic, and it's a piece of improv audio drama we think every Young Justice fan will love. You can find a playlist with all four episodes, plus the pre and post interviews with Brendan Conway on our YouTube page, and we'll include a link in today's show notes. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. This week, I want to talk about world building and plot movement using entirely non-conflict scenes. So this is particularly when you're talking about like action-related shows and comics. So one of the most powerful and interesting parts of this episode has literally no conflict of any kind. <laughs> we were all riveted to the screen trying to figure out who was whom and which kids were already canon and what was happening or being shown in the background. Um, Neil had mentioned on the DC Daily that in the blocks in the background – is the word Shin. Uh, Shin is Dr. Shin. If you've seen the live action Aquaman movie or read the Aquaman comics, Dr. Shin is a, is a physician that has gone in and out of the Aquaman mythos. So we assumed it was Archer who put that there. Um, it also happens to be the name of the storyboarder who storyboarded this scene. <laughs> so <laughs> I think, uh, maybe they layers. Put something in. layers. Exactly. Yes. This episode was counterpointed by like a brutally brutal, maybe overly brutal even combat with Lobo and a tension building mystery about who the spy was going to turn out to be. Um, but just as Emily mentioned earlier, we could watch an entire bottle episode with just this interaction in this one house. So many relationships and dynamics were established. So many questions were answered and more, even more brought up. Where's Arthur? The <laughs> awkward moment with Will Lynn, Lynn uh, Stuart Pierce commenting on being right because she had told Jeff, she knows what it's like. You're going to get back into the life. Like she commented on it, but she didn't rub rub it into anyone's face. And she didn't talk garbage behind Jeff's back, which shows a lot of integrity as a former partner and someone who respects him. There's all of this, the don't call him dad, the Amistad's appearance, who he had gotten nods to in the, in the comic tie-ins, Karen being pregnant, introducing Lady Shiva in, in one very short scene, scene that establishes her character without any reservation we understand who she is all of this stuff all of this stuff and that lady shiva scene there's conflict but not really there's just a conversation and lady shiva doing her job because there is no not there's no stopping lady shiva from doing her job so the the big implication like the light knowing that one of that every one of those partners exist and that their children exist and what does that say about every action that the light takes in the show, pretty much the only main leaguers, like we said, are like a handful. And we're not even a hundred percent sure about those. Apparently they seem to know who everyone is. So there's big reveals here in a scene. That's really kids playing in a daycare, right? At its essence, but, but not. So don't be afraid to develop your world in this kind of way. Yes. It's good to have an A and B plots to alternate between, especially when you're doing a show that's uh, expected to have some action in it. But don't ever think that the action has to take center stage. In this episode, in my opinion, this the Lobo storyline is absolutely the minor B-plot. And the understanding that the world around the main characters keeps moving, even when we aren't looking, is made very clear and is definitely the A-plot. So let's uh, dive into a little fan service. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works that we think Young Justice fans will love. One of our listeners, Sophia Erickson, has a project that's going ongoing right now. She, along with uh, other artists, have created a Young Justice zine based on its first two seasons. It's made by fans, for fans, and it's digital, or you can get a physical copy and all the proceeds uh, will go to the primary children's hospital as well. There's a few links. We'll put them in the show notes. You can take a look at the art and maybe pick up a copy for yourself to support this charity. And I think it's great. And I love seeing fans doing projects to be able to support the things that they believe in. Um, we need more charity out in the world. So thank you, Sophia, for pointing it in our direction. We'll put links in the show notes. Let's crash that mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. 
Earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 3, and Crashing the Mode will be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. These spoilers will be based on only the first 13 episodes, as that's all we've seen at this time. So if you're spoiler wary, this is your warning. Granny goodness is evil. Wait, we found that in the actual episode, right? Yes. But like G. Gordon Godfrey is also evil, but they had a scene where they're like fighting, but they're not fighting because they're on the same side because everything's connected. And ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's my very articulate take on that scene. Granny goodness has always creeped me out. She's real creepy. It, I'm I, I get it. True She's supposed facts. to. Right. But this granny goodness creeps me out more than any in the past. And that's saying something like she's like. I saw her and I was like, oh, no, no, you can't have her be like this. <laughs> no, no, she seems she seems very personable and I can't have any of that. Yes, that's this the thing because they okay. went out of their way to make her seem nice. When she's trying to be nice, she actually reads as genuinely nice, which makes it all the creepier and worse. And also just the just the thinking back, like the good goggles. And I'm just like, granny goodness, good goggles. They're, I'm like, I feel everywhere. like I feel like Dick again in that scene where he's like, why did I not see that the lamb was an anagram, an anagram for anagram bedlam? For I'm just bedlam. Like, good, wise, good, good world studios, good, good. Ah no. This reveal was not okay. <laughs> and so we continue to scream into eternity. Yeah. But as a a different uh, our other ongoing gotta have it once per episode so halo is a mother box oh yeah halo is mother box and the, yeah, reason, mm-hmm. and the reason i bring it up this time is because i realized on the millionth time through this episode that forager after having his thing with halo where they just keep repeating their names multiple times and it's very cute because they're trying to figure out how code names work it's very cute he says humans can be very slow of study when talking about all the other people who can't pick up on the weird game he thinks he's playing. And I, this time through, just went, wait, does that mean Forager genuinely doesn't interpret Halo as human? Yeah. Uh, And that's, and all I can think of is, is Halo a new god? Right? Like that thing. And I'm just like, well, maybe, maybe he doesn't think so. Yeah. Which is crazy. Maybe. Uh, Here's here's the thing that I realized earlier and had to keep my mouth shut (laughs) for crashing the mode. And maybe you can correct me because I didn't do any research. Jace goes up and hugs who? Halo. No. Who does she hug? Gabrielle. How does she know her name? That is a very good question that I don't know the answer to. How does she know her name? I don't know, Rich. Maybe, like, maybe somebody, was she, she wasn't, she wasn't around when they found it out. She wasn't around. No. She wasn't around when they found this out. Jeff could have told her, but why would Jeff use that name and not use a name respecting Halo wanting to use a different name. How does, Jeff, how does Jason know that name, Rich? I don't know. And I got a chill down my spine when you said it in the reread and said she runs up and hugs Gabrielle. And I was like, well, what? Because she shouldn't know that. She just... I, it, she could, <laughs> kind of. But again, Young Justice, we love you. We hate you. This subtlety that she could know, maybe because Jeff might have told her because Jeff has been telling her stuff, pillow talk, but we don't know for sure. Like, and why would that come up? I'm just. <laughs> but like, he, and just... He, oh, he, she specific, but then the right, you look at it and you go, the writer specifically chose this name for her to use for a reason. Yeah, it, it's, it's so much. We just don't trust Jace, and I feel so bad, because if she turns out to just be a wonderful, kind woman in the rest of this season, I'm going to feel horrible, but I just don't trust her anymore. Also, along those, just every everything she does in this episode just freaks me out now, from the fact that the moment where when she yells at Jeff to forget me and protect my kids, yeah. I'm like, why... Why is and we'll talk about it more next episode because they actually address it next episode of Jeff going that was a weird thing that you said. And her being like, what, what do you mean? Also, no hairbrushes yeah, for you. You're weird. No. Uh, but you pointing out that the light knows that uh, they didn't kill Forager. My mind immediately went, what if Jace is working with the light? 
What if we just take it that far? What if I just take our tin foil oh, hat theory Emily. all the way to the farthest end that it can oh. go? And that's how they know. Oh. Rich is not happy. Oh. Every week we lose we lose even more trust with Jace. Every week as we re- as we rewatch episodes. This is what like, you said earlier where you had a theory about how they know. Yes. I am in how else would they know? so much existential pain right now. Yep. That makes more sense to me than we have satellite cameras. No, I agree with you. I it came out of my mouth sounding stupid. And I'm just like, they can't, that's not a thing. So there's got to be a reason. Oh, Emily. I'm sorry, every is- listener, all of you, all ev- to every one of you, we apologize. We're the worst. <laughs> because I thought I was going to have the gut punch one of the episode with the Gabriel, Gabriel thing. <laughs> but no. I apologize. I didn't mean to one up you. It was a one-two punch. Uh, oh, yeah. man. But hey. To end crashing the mode with something that doesn't make us have existential dread. Roy and Artemis aren't together, and they're not together in the rest of the season that we've seen so far. And yeah, we don't have to worry about that. Right. Wait. We don't need to worry. Oh, because we see trailers from their other stuff. We haven't seen any episodes past. Th- Wait, I haven't seen any episode past thirteen. What? Wait, you said the rest of the season. Oh, you mean in the other episodes of this first half? Oh, yeah. I see. Rich, what? I don't have. I don't. What? I don't know. You said, well, that we know they're not together for the rest of the ep- the season we've seen so far. And I was like, wait, what part of the rest of the season have you seen? <laughs> up to episode 13. Okay, there we go. Now they're right, not right, together. Right. Right. And they're so not together that we see Roy interacting with <laughs> Cheshire. And also, in retrospect, it wouldn't have made any sense. The show has gone out of its way to show right. us one, that Artemis still has the photo of Wally. Yes. And for two, sure. We didn't need the confirmation that Roy and Artemis sleep in different bedrooms, but they went out of our, their way to show us that. Yes, That they sure. sleep down the hall from each other. <laughs> Absolutely. That scene could have g- taken place anywhere in the house, but they went out of their way to show us that. So, based on all of the context clues, Roy and Artemis are not a Definitely thing. Definitely not a thing. I'm glad. You mean Will. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so bad at this. <laughs> we're, we're a mess today. <laughs> Ooh. The whole Jace thing threw me off. I'm going to need to take a break before we record anything else. That's fine. <laughs> all right. And with all of that, our apologies, and we can say it out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this painful series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. If that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, subscriptions, and reviews all help other people find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.